What would it take for a, a team to have true fans? Well, let's say, let's start up a, a National Football League, you know, uh, team, and we're going to call them the Tater Tots, right? Because we're in Idaho. Right. You know, so what would uh, constitute a true fan of the Tater Tots? Somebody that would wear the jersey? Mascot. Mascot? Yeah, you know, a little Tater Tot running around, somebody dipping them in ketchup and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Well, you know, so what would be a true fan? You know, is it somebody that just shows up once in a while to the games? No, they're committed. They're committed? You know, they, they, they've got the merchandise. They, mm -hmm. they speak the language, right? You know, it's funny, our daughters, they grew up and they, they, they can uh, identify as tater tots. Mm -hmm. you, know, the, you know, Idaho, right? The, 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 the little spuds, <laughs> you know. Yep. But, it, you know, it's funny how people, you know, mm -hmm. especially football, you know, if their team is winning, all of a sudden the jerseys come out and stuff like that. If you know, especially if they make the playoffs or the Super Bowl, and boy, they're wearing it proud and everything. Mm -hmm. But if their team gets pummeled and, and, and just beat up, you know, the, the you know they're they're kind of like in disguise, right? <laughs> no, they really don't want people to know that they're true fans, right? Mm -hmm. Cl closet fans and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you can probably see where this is going. So, so the question would be. You know, what makes a true Christian? Is it somebody that wears the jersey? Or, you know, or, or shows up, you know, when the team's winning? They're faithful. Faithful? You know? There, there's a lot of aspects. You know, we, we called ourselves a Christian nation for a long time. But were we truly Christian, you know, a Christian nation? What does it mean to be a Christian nation? You know, that, uh, we called ourselves that. We were one, one nation under God, right? Mm -hmm. Problem is, is there was a lot of people worshiping other gods yet. And, and still they said, oh yeah, we're Christian. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we want to look at what does it take to truly be a Christian? Because you can say it, but is it true? Hey, I'm a, I'm a tater tot fan, you know. But, you know, when they're losing, you know, they've lost, you know, you know, they're 0 and 12, are you still a Tater Tot fan, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, well, when hard times come, you know, I think we've seen a lot of those, you know, uh, fans drop away. Because, you know, right now, you know, I think the church is going through rough times, globally. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of persecution going on. You know, as we've seen after the pandemic, a lot of people, you know, they kind of gave up on church. Because they found other things to consume their times with. So, if you have your Bibles, let's start out. We're going to start out in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I'm going to say something that may make you raise an eyebrow. First thing, to be a true Christian, you have to be of the chosen. Does that make anybody's eyebrows raise? Well, let's find out what God says. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we'll start out at verse 13. It says, But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel, that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we start out with, we, we have to be chosen. How many of us in here are chosen? Well, it said right there, this happens through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. What sanctified me? Set apart, okay, to make holy. It's also to be free from sin. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it also says there that, that um, and through belief in the truth. Mm -hmm. What is truth? That is one of those questions that, you know, I think mankind is, is hungry for. Everybody, you know, what is the truth? I want to know what the truth is. The Word of God. 
the gospel message. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So by believing in the truth, believing in Jesus, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are among the chosen. Mm -hmm. See, a lot of people think that God, you know, there's a, you know, they'll argue about predestination. Mm -hmm. You know, God only chose some. And those that, that didn't choose, you know, the, those that aren't, you know, Christians, they, they weren't chosen by God. That, that's a lie. Mm -hmm. It's up to us to believe in the gospel message. Those that believe, you know, put, put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ, he's the one that's promised us the Holy Spirit that comes in and, and, and cleanses us mm -hmm. and sanctifies us. And we're made in right standing with God. That's step number one with becoming a Christian. See, and that's the thing. There's a lot of churches filled with people that have not gotten past step one. But yet they call themselves Christians. Are then they true Christians? No. You know, they're, they're Christian in name only. You know, the, the whole idea behind being a Christian is we follow the teachings of Christ. He is our Lord and our Savior. Amen. So you have to be chosen. But is that enough? You know, does our journey stop there? Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't. See, we're supposed to continue, you know, as Peter put it, to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, so let's look at this idea a little bit of, okay, so how do we be Christ-like? How do we be a Christian? Turn back just a couple of pages to Colossians chapter 3. We've been working our way through Colossians and, and looking at the, 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 just the powerful message that's contained in, in, inside this tiny little book here. And we've made it down, or we're going to start out at verse 12. And it says in Colossians chapter 3 verse 12, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. We, we just established that fact, right? Mm -hmm. We are God's chosen people. He chose to save those who would believe the gospel message. To receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's all about Him. So in Him we were chosen, therefore we're holy and dearly loved. See, you know, that's, I think that's something that, you know, we, we could spend a whole lot of time just talking about that idea right there. Much of the world around us right now has never experienced true love. Mm -hmm. what, what does it mean, you know, God says that he dearly loves us? He knows us. He knows our past. He knows what we've done, but yet he's willing to forgive our sins in Christ Jesus. And in Christ Jesus, we're declared holy, without spot, without blemish, dedicated for his use. Only God's power can achieve that because we know what sin does, the stains that sin creates inside the, the human spirit. And that's what we see running around so many people, you know, covered with their sins, thinking that they found love someplace you know, and I think that's one of the sad things. You know, they're, they're driven to, to extremes to try and find what they call love. Mm -hmm. But it's not true love. It's, it's a deceptive kind of love. People have turned to all sorts of, of idolatry or, or to wickedness, thinking that what they have there is true love. And boy, if you bring up, you know, what you're doing is wrong, they'll say, well, isn't it okay to love? Not that kind of love. That, that, that's a sinful kind of love. God's love is pure. And that's what he wants us to experience, is that pure kind of love that he and he only can pour out upon us. So that's our state. We are chosen, we are holy, and we are dearly loved. And it says, therefore, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, 
humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgave, or excuse me, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Now, th these, th these verses right here, these paint to me a very clear picture of the, uh, uh, of the attitude that Christ had for us and for the world around us. We're to be imitators of Christ. Doesn't this kind of sum up Christ's uh, attitude towards us while he was here and how, the attitude he still has towards us? You can look at these things. Compassion. Did Christ have compassion for the world around us? He went to those that were of not, the lowly things of this world. And, and, and he, he brought them back into this relationship with him. He offered salvation for even them. The worst of sinners. Mm -hmm. Compassion, kindness. Can you say that Christ was kind? I mean, think about what he did for each and every one of us. I, I think about how he sought me out and he showed me love. Humility. I mean, Christ's humility. He's God and he put on flesh and he came and he served. He didn't come to be served. See, that's one of the big arguments that, that Muslims have is, well, Christ, never, you know, he never said that he, he was going to receive worship. He wasn't here to receive worship. He was here to provide that sacrificial lamb for the forgiveness of sins. He humbly offered himself up as that sacrifice. He served mankind. He served his disciples. They should have been the ones offering to wash his feet there at the Last Supper. But yet he girded himself and washed their feet. And he says, basically, what you've seen me do, now I want you to go and do it. Gentleness. Has Christ been gentle with you? And how he is turned you away from the world and brought you to him. You know, there's a song out there that he, he brings us gently to our knees. He knows exactly what it takes. These are all pictures of Christ himself and patience. <laughs> has, has God been long suffering with you? I know he's been long suffering with me. But then he asks us to bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And now, that, now it's getting tough, isn't it? To forgive those people that may have hurt you. Who may have mocked you. You know, it's easy to forgive a loved one. How about to forgive an enemy? Or somebody that's done you wrong mistreated you. You know, think about what, I mean, Christ himself, I mean, he's being crucified and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The very love that he had for us and his willingness to forgive our sins the fact that we didn't, we didn't understand what we were doing, you know, and, and, and I, the fact that we were offering up the Lamb of God as, as an offering. And he was doing it willingly. So we're to imitate Christ's compassion, forgiving attitude. You know, that, that's one of the steps in being a Christian is to be just like him. I don't know about you, but I could take those two verses and I have a lifetime worth of work right there in my own spirit. But then the question is, is that enough? Well, let's look. And it says in verse 14, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. <clears throat> you know, to... to, to, to 
Take all those attributes and bind them up with love. You know, if you're loving on somebody, you can be patient with them, right? But let me ask you, is it enough just to do one of those acts that we just looked at? Is it okay to be kind but not patient? Or is it kind to be hum or is it okay to be humble but not compassionate? You know, Christ, he took all those things and he bound them together because of his love for us. And that's what he's telling us to do is bind them all together with love. You know, and again, that verse right there, I could spend a lifetime trying to work through that. Loving on people, especially those that maybe I'm mad at. Ever been mad with somebody? <coughs> Furious? And God's saying, I want you to love them. You know, you, you look at what God did for his people. He loved them enough to send them into captivity. Because they had a problem. Idol worship. He says, fine, you want, to idol, you want to worship idols? I'll send you to where there's every idol, I mean, more than you'll ever want. And I think after they came back a cap, from captivity, <coughs> you'll notice they never seemed to have another idol worshiping problem after that. They just had a lordship problem. But you see, bind these all together with love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Isn't that what God desires for the church? His perfect unity? How will we achieve that? Through love. You know, you look at John chapter 17 and, and Jesus praying. That's what his prayer was for the church. Is that we be united. Just as he and the Father are one, he says, let them be one with us. You know, we've been looking at that. Is Christ the head of the church? He's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. The word of God. But in how many locations is the word of God not, not taught? Or is it, you know, cherry picked? You know, they'll, they'll take a passage and man, they'll make doctrine out of maybe five words. And totally miss what God is saying. And I think you can judge a church by those first few verses we looked at. You know, are they compassionate, kind, you know, humble, gentle, and are they patient? There's a lot of churches out there that claim to be Christian, but you won't find any of those attributes inside the walls of the church or even outside the church. So if we bind them all together with love, you know, let love guide our lives. Not, and I'm not talking the, the kind of love the world is promoting. Because right now, the kind of love the world is promoting is a, is, a, is a wicked kind of love. You know, God's the one that set the rules. And he did it for our good. He continues on. He says in verse 15, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. What does it mean for the, the peace of Christ to rule in our hearts? It should have preeminence. You know, the peace of Christ. What kind of peace do we have through Christ? Well, we're told in Romans that we have peace with God. Because of what Christ did for us. I think that's what we see a lot of going on around us. Is there is so much of the world that's in turmoil because they don't have that peace that Christ wants to offer them. They're trying to find that which satisfies in their life. And they're not finding it. And they're getting mad. Because they thought, well, if I do this, I'll be happy. And they find out they're not happy. If I have that, I'll be satisfied. And they find out that they're not satisfied. But when we have Christ in our lives, he fills that void inside of us. And it says, let that peace rule in our lives. You know, 
He's offered us something that's without. We, we can't place any value on this because it's priceless. To have peace right now in the world around us, what would people pay for that? You know, people have gone out and they've sought, you know, chemical means of finding this peace through drugs or through alcohol or through all the different things that are available in life, and yet nothing is, is fulfilling that desire in their hearts. But the peace of Christ will. And he tells us as Christians, let that rule in our lives. Then he throws this in here too, and be thankful. What are we thankful for? We just got done celebrating Thanksgiving. You know, are, are we thankful for the things that we do have? I think it's kind of odd. You know, this time of year we're supposed to be being thankful for what we do have, and the media is telling us, here's all the things that you want for Christmas. You know, here's what you need to be happy. No, I've got everything I need to be happy. Because I have everything that brings me peace in my life right now. And that's Jesus himself. Mm-hmm. And it continues on. And it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. There are so many people that don't even know what the word of Christ is. You know, if you ask them, what does the Bible say about this? They couldn't even tell you. They'll tell you what the world thinks. But how important was this to God? That the word of God dwell inside of us. Very important. In fact, here, let me read you a passage. This is found out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. And this may be a familiar passage to you when you start to hear it. The Lord has just given Israel the Ten Commandments. He has just instructed Moses on on all the commands that they're supposed to to obey, okay? And and then he goes on to say here in verse 4, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Here, you know, the Lord is impressing upon them. This was the written word, the written law. And, 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 and he says here, you, you need to be talking about these things. And, and it starts out with the very most important thing. They are to be upon your hearts. But that was the problem is the word wasn't upon their hearts. The commands of God. You know, they went around and, you know, they they would put these scriptures in a little box and they would tie them to their head as a show. You know, and and how many people do that as a show? They may have something, you know, a little scripture or someplace around their place. Oh, that's my motto. You know, it's like, well, okay, what does that mean? Well, it's not written on their hearts because they don't know. You know, that's my scripture. You know, God was telling the nation of Israel, here are these commands I give you. You know, they're important. Write them down. You know, and, but it started out with the Lord your God. You know, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might or your strength. You know, if you, if you, if you really think about the Ten Commandments, you know, the first four are about loving God. 
But the nation of Israel really didn't want to love God, did they? They wanted God's blessings, but they wanted to go out and have their fun too because all the gods from around them, you know, the Ashtoreths and all those things, that was fun. You know, that made them feel good. That made them feel like they were doing something to impress God or that God. God says, no, you shall have no other gods before me. Don't make any graven images, no idols. Keep my divine appointments. Don't misuse my name. You know, that's all about loving God. And he's saying, I want you to take these commands and write them on your heart. You keep them in your heart and, 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 and in, your, in your homes and talk about them, you know, as you're going and as you're traveling and with your children and with, you know, just, are they, are they important? Well, turning back to Colossians there, it says, in back, let's reread verse 16. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Well, to teach, you have to know the word, what it says. You know, does the word of Christ dwell in us richly? Or does the word of some commentator or some other pastor or something else dwell in our hearts? Well, the denomination says this. Well, is it in accordance with the Bible? And it says there, as you, uh, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God, I think the idea is, is to keep God's word in us at all times. You know, we were talking about that a little bit in Sunday school, you know. It'd be great as if we get up every morning and read God's word and, and spend time with him. But, you know, in the lives that we have sometimes, you know, there, we, we seem to not have time for that. But we can still have the word of God inside of us. And, and, and if we're not remembering some of the things that God says, I don't know about you, but you know, every now and then, have you gotten a song stuck in your head? Sometimes it's not the right songs, right? You ever gotten a commercial stuck in your head? You know, some advertisement, some soap commercial or something like that, that little ditty going through your head during the day? We'll replace it with something. Maybe, you know, sing a song to God, a song or, you know, some kind of praise to him. Spiritual songs. And it says with gratitude in our hearts. You know? I, I think about, you know, there's a song that, you know, that we sing sometimes. There's within my heart a melody. You know, what's within our hearts? You know, we're told that it's supposed to be the, the word of God. Mm -hmm. You know? And, 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 it, and it says there with gratitude. In verse 17, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. To do something in the name of the Lord Jesus means we're acting as his representatives. We're his ambassadors. See, you know, a lot of times you know, we'll pray, oh, in Jesus' name, so is that the, the tricky phrase that gets God's attention? Just because we said in Jesus' name? Lord, I want to win the lottery in Jesus' name. That's going to make it happen, right? No, we're saying, Lord, this is something that Jesus himself would have prayed for. And I'm praying for it also. To go around and be his ambassadors. To, to say, Lord... I know this is something that Christ himself would have wanted. You know, I think about what church has become. You know, he went to the temple and he, he got mad because of the, the, the money changers tables and those that were selling things in, in, in his house, in the Lord's house. You know, what has the church become? For a lot of people, it's a social event. It's all about the, the coffee shop out front or the, the we're going to have something after service. We're going to go out and do all these things. Christ himself was worried about glorifying God 
and, and keeping, you know, the temple holy. We should be worried about honoring God's name and doing what he's called us to do. So, how to be a Christian? I think we have some, some good verses right here to, to base our lives off of. We could spend a lifetime just working on these few verses right here, and I still think, at least in Kent's life, I still have a lot of work to do. But I think it's important. What, you know, we can call ourselves Christians, but what does that look like? I, I, I would rather see somebody acting out being a Christian than just naming it. Then, you know, so many people, well, I'm a Christian. Oh, well, let's see. Let's, let, let's look in Colossians and see if you, you match the description. If somebody were to take this set of descriptions and say, well, let's see how well you do. How would you, how, how would you grade out? Would we get an A? B? C, passing grade? F? Time to retake the course again? We're always working on ourselves, aren't we? So I would challenge you. You know, it's about being in Christ. We have been chosen because of our faith in Him. God chose us to be like His Son. I don't know about you, but to hear those words that you are chosen and dearly loved, how much would this world change if they understood that God wants them, that he loves them? He wants to bring them in so that they too can have peace with God. How much would that change the world around us? Because I don't know about you, but right now all I see out there is hate and violence. Or at least that's what's coming through. Well, there's a message out there, the gospel message. And we are to be his ambassadors. To live for him and to be Christ-like. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for the message that you've brought to us, Lord, from, from, through the Apostle Paul, Lord, and through Colossians. Lord, we, we thank you for, for teaching us and telling us what you desire of us and what you want us to be. So, Lord, I pray that you will help us to be that which you've called us to be, to be like your son. Lord, we ask for for a refreshing and a renewing once again, not for just us, Lord, but for all of your people, yes. for your church, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you'll pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and refresh us and refill us and challenge us to be that which you've called us to be yes. so that the world around us will see that light and be drawn to it, the light of your Son and the love that you have for us. Lord, we ask that you will continue to, to give us opportunities to be that which you've called us to be, to go and make disciples of all nations, to, to be the church you want us to be. We love you and we ask for these blessings in your son's name, Lord, in Jesus' wonderful and precious name.